now it's really my great pleasure to introduce our next next generation leader as uh, the speaker, Viviana Gradinaro. Uh, Viviana is currently an uh, assistant professor at Caltech. She originally came from Romania, uh, trained as a physicist. She obtained her undergraduate degree uh, from Caltech and switched to biology. And then she uh, did her PhD at Stanford with Carl Dysroth. Um, her PhD uh, study is really um, at the very front edge of technology development for optogenetics. She has published really seminal and influential work in uh, developing new opsins for activating, you know, light-induced activation and inactivation of neurons. And one, uh, and this one particular very useful um, uh, uh, technique or understanding in how to expressing how to express non-mammalian or even non-vertebrate proteins in uh, uh, mammalian cells uh, very robustly and, and, and functionally working well. And she um, identified you know, specific tags that can um, uh, help the protein to uh, uh, localize the membrane and transport it to the cell membrane really well, and that really facilitate the uh, functionality of those um, uh, proteins. Um, in addition to that kind of a very uh, meticulous technical work, she has also um, been working in using the optogenetic uh, technique to uh, study uh, psychiatric neurological disorders, um, or maybe understanding uh, the uh, pathology and the treatment options uh, for those uh, disorders. You know, one major example, and I think she continued to have that interest uh, uh, in um, uh, relating deep brain stimulation uh, with the uh, treatment of uh, the Parkinson's disease. So in addition to the optogenetic work, studying in Carl's lab, she already um, uh, were also working on other uh, technologies, um, uh, mainly the brain clearing or tissue clearing technologies, uh, and trying to use that to do large-scale imaging um, not only of neuronal morphology uh, or other um, anatomical structures, uh, but also use that as a way to examine gene expression and uh, protein ex expression. She, um, her graduate work is really fantastic, and she did a very, very short uh, postdoc in uh, Carl's lab before she established her own lab at Caltech. And very quickly in Caltech, she also uh, recently completed a, a nice set of work in uh, the further optimization of the uh, tissue clearing um, uh, technique, and she developed a whole body uh, clearing technology now. Um, Viviana is not a stranger uh, to the institute. She was actually one of the invited speakers uh, for the Anna Institute Symposium last year. Um, but I'm sure that today <laughs> she will have a lot of different things to talk about. No. Welcome, Viviana. for the invitation, especially being invited two times within a year. It's um, a great honor, but also a huge challenge because then you're left wondering how fast do I have to work and how much do I have to work to say different things. Um, so what I said last year was that um, I would stay very close to the data. If you stay close to the data, you can present different things every year or every month. If you instead present a big vision, that doesn't move as quickly. So I'll my first two slides are identical as last year, and the reason being that the core interest of my lab didn't change. Um, you can see this cute picture here. Recently, I showed this to an MD-heavy audience, and um, nobody was distracted or impressed because they looked at it, they frowned, and they said, uh, great, most of them will have Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. So, um, yes. Let's see if this uh, advances. I hope it does. Is the pointer on? OK. So if you look at uh, population pyramids past, somewhat present, and distant future, you can see that we 
figured out ways to keep the body living longer and longer, but our ability to keep the brain healthy to match the increased lifespan is not as good. Um, so we have um, a challenge to preserve neuronal health long term. So one of the big um, areas of study in my lab is what allows a cell to be healthy throughout the aging process. And especially with focus onto the Parkinsonian um, degeneration that you can see here. So in Parkinson's, dopaminergic cells degenerate and this causes motor imp impairments. And when medication stops working, one of the few possibilities for those patients is to have deep brain electrodes implanted. And this works very well to address the symptoms. However, it doesn't keep those cells healthy necessarily. And what's amazing about this technology is that it works very well in, in basic research and also in clinics, but we don't know the mechanism. So one of the um, initial work uh, when we had the optogenetic tools, as soon as we had both excitatory inhibitory tools, one of the first um, experiments using in vivo, optogenetics in vivo, was to un try to understand this challenge of how does deep brain stimulation work by using, rather than non-specific electrical stimulation, using instead uh, specific modulation, either excitation or inhibition with opsins. And this audience is very familiar to this concept, so I will present this rather in a compressed fashion. But what was surprising out of this study was that rather than um, stimulating cell bodies at the electrode site, so you can implant the electrode, the location is a deep nucleus, the subthalamic nucleus, but modulating those cell bodies at the contact site was not able to replicate the therapeutic effects. Instead, what was effective was to modulate the axons, whether it's axons synapsing onto the nucleus or axons of fibers that's still under debate. But this differentiation that you could stimulate a deep brain and your effects might actually be implemented very distant from the electrode site. This concept was something that was very interesting and also highlighted the fact that we need better maps. Um, so we pointed the source of those projections superficially to the cortex, and this is encouraging, especially in clinics, because if you don't have to place your electrode deep into the brain, you decrease the likelihood of hemorrhage. But this pathway is in a mouse. And how much can you take from knowledge in a, in a small brain of a mouse? And how good of a um, coincidence you'll get into a human case? That's, a, a, that's always a question whenever we try to talk about translational science. So fortunately, when I was working on this project, um, my mentor at the time, Dr. Jamie Henderson in the DBS clinic at Stanford, was interested to see whether these pathways can be found in humans as well. Um, and what he observed uh, by using DTI imaging in Parkinsonian uh, patients, he saw the tracts spanning cortical areas and focusing onto the STN. And in the same paradigm, there were electrode arrays implanted on the cortex. And while the electrode was stimulating the deep subthalamic nucleus, he could see modulation of the cortical activity. So this highlighted a paradigm whereby doing a rather deep intervention within the brain, your effects might be delocalized from the electrode side. And then it becomes very, very important to understand the brain in its in entirety with the cell types differences, with the connections. And that's why the work that has been done at the Allen Brain Institute in terms of mapping the brain is ex extremely important because we cannot think about nuclei of the brain in isolation. It, it's a network. So what you see here, these fibers are all in yellow for convenience purposes, but most likely they have different identities. Most likely they mediate other diff either different neurotransmitters or different action potentials, so their physiological role would be rather different. So what this points to the fact is that we need to understand long-range connectivity, not only in terms of where things start and end, but also in terms of their identity. So this is where mapping, especially mapping of long-range projections and of axons becomes very important. As you're very familiar um, here at the Allen Brain Institute, the conventional thin slicing and serial 
while very powerful, it could lead to uh, undersampling. It's impossible to image everything in very large volumes. And for the axons, if you try to realign, imagine you cut this bundle, and then you try to realign the axons, the fine axons, the likelihood of uh, errors occurring is rather high. So instead, a, a useful technology would be to bypass the slicing problem. And there's been many, many decades of work in tissue clearing, and the most common um, formulation is to soak tissue into media that match the refractive index, which allows just better optical access um, to visualize, let's say, endogenous fluorescence. However, to obtain cell type identity, you also need not only optical access, but also molecule access, antibodies, small dyes, to be able to start phenotyping as well. So what's needed is not only a method that will allow you to see deep endogenous signal, but also allow you to stain and repeatedly stain. And this is where work from uh, uh, that started at Stanford during my postdoc and then continued in my lab at Caltech, uh, we um, iterated on, on this method. So today I will tell you about two stories. One is the, our most recent work on tissue clearing, on trying to optimize and um, streamline the procedure. And recently I um, heard a beautiful talk from Dr. Marder, and she said that uh, something along the lines that co connectomics is absolutely necessary and completely insufficient. And I think what we've heard from the talks until now reflects this. There is a big push to go beyond mapping and anatomy and try to add functionality. And functionality can come in different flavors, can be action potentials, can be transcriptomics, immediate early genes. Um, so this is, um, will take me to the second part of the talk where I'll mention some of our very recent work was just published yesterday um, in the area of using opsins for voltage sensing. So it's still optogenetics, but it's just a different flavor of it. Um, why do we need tissue clearing? I think um, this sequence of images um, drive the point quite well. Um, this is a rendering of uh, clarity in its initial form, a Thai one YFP rodent uh, cleared an image in terms of endogenous fluorescence. Um, this is not where the novelty of clarity lays. The novelty of clarity is in the ability actually to be able to diffuse the antibodies and the molecules. So the first generation was um, published just last year, and what you see here is the ability to label with multiple fluorescent proteins and to identify different cell types in, in thick volumes of tissues. Um, like any technology, there's multiple generations. Early days of optogenetics were, I remember, rather challenging when, for example, the excitatory opsin was working for all projects and inhibitory was very good at killing cells. Those were tough days, and we ended up spending a lot of time troubleshooting to make halorodopsin control neurons without damaging them. Um, in a similar way, with any new technology, there's some rough beginning times. Um, so for tissue clearing, the concept that we really wanted to add to the tissue clearing was uh, speed. Most paradigms prior to clarity were relying on passive action, soaking in strong organic solvents um, and waiting. The organic solvents can be damaging to endogenous fluorescence, so this makes transgenic mouse work rather difficult. Um, however, they're fast. If you soak your tissue in gentle solvents, through passive diffusion, clearing takes a long time. So a useful concept in the original formulation of clarity was that we don't have to be passive about the clearing process. Let's try to speed it up. And the way it was sped up was by applying an electrical field. Because the lipids, the, the principle for clarity is that the, you need to remove the lipids. Those are the um, components of the tissue that scatter light the most and that prevent the ability to have optical access to very um, thick volumes. So the idea is that you need to remove the lipids, but the lipids do have an extremely, extremely important role in not only in the living tissue, but also to maintain the shape of, of fixed tissue as well. So if you remove the lipids, what happens, your tissue flattens out as a pancake. So you need to replace that structure of support with something that provides a similar role, but in a transparent fashion instead. So the solution in this case from, came from acrylamide monomers that when polymerized will form a transparent
decision, but this is, and that's what we did as a short-term solution when some of the samples were damaged. Um, passive diffusion works well. It doesn't allow you to clear entire brains, and it was, you know, disappointing because we went back to the beginning where we just have to wait a long time. Um, so what my, when I started my group at um, Caltech, we focused on this problem. Let's maintain the speed of electrophoresis, but try to use a system that would not damage the sample. Um, so this was the um, result that we recently published. So in this report, we, it's a practical resource, um, and we report um, a few key methods and reagents. First of them is a passive clarity method where we drop the crosslinker, the bisacrylamide, and what this does is to speed up lipid outflow from the tissue and also creates larger pores, which is better for antibody staining. Um, to image clear tissue, you need to soak your cleared sample into a media that matches the refractive index. Uh, you might be familiar or not with the use of focus clear. There are some difficulties in using it. So we've um, invested a lot of time into perfecting a formulation that's available with reagents that any lab will have and that they ca uh, can be made in the lab. So that's the RIMS, the refractive index matching solution that we have the recipe in the paper. One worry was that how much proteins and RNAs you're preserving with this, and I'll show you some data around that. And uh, I would say the big novelty of this report is that we um, sped up clearing by using perfusive flow through the endogenous circulatory system of any organism, which is the vasculature or the cerebrospinal fluid. And this resulted in clearing um, not only entire organs, but also entire organisms. Um, staying close to the data here, um, how much do you lose when you flush out lipids? What else do you flush? If you have sparse proteins or um, rare samples, do you just reduce your signal to under the detection level? So we were interested in measuring protein loss and also to see whether we're able to detect mRNA. So this um, figure here shows you detection of single molecules of RNA in thick tissue. And this experiment showed us two things. One, that the RNAs are preserved. We can detect them. And the other thing that was a pleasant surprise was that we could image much deeper. Um, single molecule RNA detection in tissue has been a challenge. There's a, there are a lot of beautiful reports on cultured cells, which is one layer of neurons not as much in um, thick slices because of the autofluorescence and the signal is too small. So what we've noticed in the clear samples is that we could actually detect at much deeper levels. And um, we didn't test our limits here. This is just to show that at 30 micrometers, you have much higher signal than in, um, in non-clear tissue. Okay. Um, because the goal, the initial goal, we are a neuroscience lab, and the initial goal was to make clarity work better for the brain and spinal cord. So we decided to use the cerebrospinal fluid route as a delivery route for the acrylamide monomers and for the detergents and all of the reagents. And what you can see here is that this somehow worked. Um, one caveat would be that it clears best at the cannula side, so you're quite familiar with cannulation experiments. You can insert a cannula and then deliver viruses or chemicals, in this case, detergents and other chemicals through the cannula. But this uh, works best at around the cannula side. So if you just want to clear that area, that's good. But there is the worry of over clearing. If you want to clear the entire brain, you might over clear next to the cannula and under clear at the edges. So that prompted us to look at routes that are somewhat more uniformly distributed to the brain. And this uh, pointed us to the, let's see if I can take that back, um, to the vasculature. We thought the vasculature is present throughout the body and it should allow us access. And to test this, first we infuse nanobodies in um, a living uh, organism through the circulatory system. You can infuse nanobodies and then we uh, perfused and we passively cleared tissue. So the nanobody delivery was through the vasculature, but the clearing was passive. And what you can see here is that you can label vasculature in a mouse and in a rat and very fine capillaries. And the nanobodies get out of the bloodstream and into the tissue as well. Um, so what you can see here is uh, GFAP staining in 
to a method that um, could be developed to allow you to deliver the reagents throughout the body. And this is a flow chart of the protocol. Everybody doing rodent work is quite familiar with transcardial perfusion. Uh, this is just the method, except that rather than trying to finish up quickly in five minutes, we take this four weeks, depending on the organic size. And we change the reagents, um, we deliver so the fixative, then we deliver the monomers, we polymerize, we infuse the SDS, and then we clear uh, by using a pump, the same exact system that you would use for transcardial perfusion. Uh, again, the goal was to clear the brain well. What was rather surprising was how quickly other organs were clearing. Within one or two days, um, organs other than the brain were completely clear. For the brain, it does take longer. It can take a week for a mouse and two weeks for a rat. So it depends on the body size and on the strain and on the perfusion flow. So there is some leeway depending on what you want to achieve. Um, but an, ad an added benefit, because this process you can conduct it with in situ, while as much of the organism is intact, including skull, um, muscle, bones, ligaments, it turns out that these um, structures actually control swelling. So if you imagine clearing a brain within the skull, there's a limit to how much it can swell. So what we realized when we took the brain out is that the swelling was rather minor. Of course, when you take an acrylamide mass and then you put it into solutions, there's going to be swelling. But when you take it out, the, the swelling is minimal. So this could be useful as well for registration purposes. Uh, we measure the protein loss. And one, um, not only we noticed that the protein loss is minimal, but we compared how much we lose by using Triton in conventional histology. And what we noticed was that we actually lose more protein by slicing and washing than with acrylamide. Acrylamide might actually lock in place parts that are sparse to detect. So even for conventional histology, if there's interest to detect very sparse proteins or immediate early genes, there might be some benefit to using acrylamide. Um, and this allowed us to let's see if this will play. It's supposed to be a movie. OK. To image these samples, you need to put them into refractive index media. This is a figure that's buried in the supplement, but I think it's very important for people that want to adopt the method. And it shows a comparison of the properties uh, between a variety of refractive index media um, matching uh, formulations. And what we did was to vary the concentration of the reagents to obtain different indexes um, that could be adjusted based on your microscope or sample or, or objective. And that's, that's what this figure shows. What you see in C is a brain that was not cleared at all. It's a mouse brain that was fixed and that was soaked in this solution for about a month. And you can see it's rather clear. So if there's no need for staining, uh, and instead it's only need to image endogenous fluorescence, there is the possibility to use the media to just um, image that um, uh, fluorescence. And that's um, shown at the bottom, the variety of timelines. And um, yeah, all is detailed in the protocols. And this allows you, this is one example of a column through the brain. The thickness is about 4.5 um, millimeters. Um, in a transgenic animal, and you can see that the fluorescence is well preserved. This is very similar to what the uh, original rendering of the meta was showing. It's just to show that the reagents that we use are not quenching. And you can get similar quality fluorescence after samples were stored in rims for many weeks and even months. Um, we have samples that have been stored now for about three months, and we can detect fluorescence. Um, it could go longer than that, but we just don't know yet. Um, what you can see here related to the DBS challenge that I pointed to you before, you do see the fine axons, crossings, and you don't need to guess and realign them. So this is the uh, strength of not sectioning the tissue for mapping purposes. Okay. Um, I mentioned that uh, other organs were cleared as well. For other organs, we could stain through the vasculature, and what you can see here is uh, liver, lung, and pancreas with a variety of stains, just to show that this is a generalizable method, um, although the focus of the meeting is uh, neuroscience. And um, here is a rendering of the intestine. And I'm just showing this 
there's a lot of work that needs to be done. If you have a clear tissue, you can just image it and then you have access to your data very quickly. Okay. Um, we started the talk uh, with neurodegeneration in mind, so I'd like to spend just a few minutes um, telling you how we got to the clarity in first place. The initial goal was to make uh, cells uh, indestructible to degeneration, in, at least in terms of shape. When a neuron dies, it gets fractured and engulfed by macrophages, and then it vanishes. So this makes experiments such as 6-OHDA lesion of dopaminergic cells rather challenging because you, you compare the histology and you're basing your assumptions on missing information. You don't see what cells died and where those were. You just see that you have more in the ones that didn't get a toxin or didn't get a neurodegeneration agent. So an initial goal was to make those cells uh, maintained in the tissue. And to, to illustrate this better, if you have a cell in culture that has M. cherry and you drop water on it, it bursts and then it vanishes from sight. So what we wanted to achieve was to make the cell not vanish from sight and stays, stay there as a presence. Um, the initial um, efforts were around chitin because chitin is a very strong polymer, it's the strongest polymer in nature. And interestingly, the monomers that make up chitin are present in neurons. But the synthase that's responsible for the filaments is not present. So the idea was that you could add that enzyme and induce polymers in neurons. This failed. Um, what you see there in, uh, in the staying, it's a positive control for antibody to uh, make sure that it was working, but we could never produce chitin in neurons, and neither did cellulose and silk. Um, and this brought back a lesson from halorhodopsin. When we try to use halorhodopsin into mammalian cells, we run into a lot of trouble. Reason being that the origins were very distinct. You see chitin and cellulose and silk are also very distinct from mammalians. And that pointed to a source closer to home, which is keratins. You have it in hair, in nails, but you don't have it in neurons. So uh, we express the two genes that make one of the keratin pairs and can make filaments. When they're expressed independently, they're granular. When they're expressed together, they form filaments. And they can fill in cells. So what you see here is a cell culture experiment where in green you have the two keratin genes expressed and making a polymer that fills the neuron. And in red, you have the cells that have just the M cherry. Now when you apply water, you destroy everything except the ones that have been polymerized. It fills all the processes very well, and you, you can think of it as a um, genetically encoded fixative that could be conditioned by activity or other markers. Um, we took that a step further to see if it can be maintained in a 3D structure of the brain, so we maintain this in collagen networks that could uh, be maintained for uh, we tested up to six months, but uh, it's not the limit to it. And because this is genetic, a genetically encoded system, we could also express it in, in vivo. And all this work was initially written in, um, in 2011. It's available online to read. Now, how was the transition to clarity? In order to image the cells, we wanted to remove, so the initial write-up described the idea of a hydrogel support to cells that are endure, made uh, strong and then removing the distracting elements with detergents. When we tried to do that, what we realized was that you could see much, much deeper in the tissue. Now, because everything was fixed, it didn't matter what had keratin and what didn't. So this turned into clarity for the entire brain, and this work was driven by Kwang Gun Chang now at MIT. And since then, we've achieved a whole body clearing by um, replacing the electrophoretic field with perfusive flow the circulatory systems instead. Um, and you can see very high level of detail. Um, on the top is the brain down to the synaptic level, and the bottom is the kidney. And I'll, um, let's see, because we've seen a lot of uh, brain movies uh, for a change, I'll show you how beautiful the kidney is. I didn't know the kidney is so beautiful before clearing one. Um, so tissue clearing, I think there's still a lot of challenges, data storage, making sense of the data. Antibodies are still too large, so we've had some preliminary success with nanobodies. The challenge is that there are not as many available. The, um, the camelid ones, you need camels to make them. That's a, a, ba a barrier to progress. But hopefully this is enough motivation to, 
for most proteins of interest in neuroscience. Okay, so um, we we started the talk by saying that anatomy gives you some context, but it, it's not sufficient by itself. And very recent work focused on repurposing some of the opsins that we worked on for voltage sensing instead. This is not a new concept. Um, the fact that archirodopsin could emit photons uh, when the membrane voltage changes was reported by Adam Cohen um, in a beautiful paper a few years back. Um, so this is a, a cartoonish illustration of um, the archirodopsin that could absorb green light, flux protons, which leads to neuronal inhibition, but at the same time it can re absorb redshifted photons and emit further redshifted light, and this emission is a function of the membrane voltage, and it could be used to monitor activity. Um, and this was nicely illustrated in prior work. One difficulty was that the signal was extremely small. These proteins don't emit a lot of light, so detection is a problem, especially in scattering tissue. And since then, there's been a lot of work on trying to optimize either microbial opsins for emitted fluorescence or other variants, GFP-based variants, where um, quantum yield is not a, a big of, of a concern. So what our efforts focused on was to try to improve our coerodopsin, because we, we do work on opsins mainly in the lab. We teamed up with the chemistry and chemical engineering lab at Caltech, the lab of Francis Arnold, that pioneer directed evolution. So we worked together to generate libraries and to screen for them in um, E. coli for the ones that have the most fluorescence. And then we narrowed down on the ones that not only have the most fluorescence, but that are tolerated in neurons, because that's not a straightforward thing. You modify an opsin and you realize it doesn't work in neurons anymore. So we narrowed down on only two of those candidates. Th these were all huge libraries, you think, like thousands and thousands of variants. And we narrowed down on two that had the collective properties of increased fluorescence, the neurons were tolerating it well, um, and also the currents, very important, the currents have to be zero or minimal, because if you want to use the tool as an actuate, uh, as a sensor, you don't want to be actuating. Um, so you want these two um, separated. Um, so what you see here is that the, the variants, we call them archers. Um, this reminds me, like, when I saw the GECO acronym, Stanford is a good training for acronyms. We <laughs> maybe we're overdoing it at times, but um, so what you see here is a comparison of the archers that came out of the libraries with the prior version that uh, um, Mark Schnitzer from uh, Stanford evolved that had superior optical emission versus the wild type arch. Um, so you can see that as you step the membrane vault, these are patch cells electrophysiology, and I'm grateful for the introduction before, just standard wall cell patch clamping. Uh, we step the membrane voltage in 10 millivolts increments, and you can see that the fluorescence can distinguish those steps in the variance. What you see in the movie is the big step from, uh, it's from minus 70 to 50 millivolts, and I'll show you the action potentials in the next slide. In uh, E is the kinetics, which shows you that the change is uh, it's happening with millisecond pre precision, which hints to the possibility of using it to track action potentials. So what we've done here was to inject current and um, cause either 20 hertz or 40 hertz um, activity in cells, and we were able to track it optically. And Lisa nicely illustrated the idea of uh, dendritic potentials and how different dendrites could have different potentials. So what you see in the color traces is highlights of the corresponding dendrites so you can track voltage changes in processes as well, which, um, which could be useful. Again, all this work is in culture. Um, detecting voltage in scattering media is a big challenge, and that's something that still needs to be worked out. Um, I'll show you, though, two more things related to this tool. One is the ability to use it as a bifunctional tool for sensing and inhibition. And the other one is the first proof of concept of using a microbial opsin in a living organism, granted a transparentized living organism, but um, in a living organism for behavior. Um, what you see here, because we had residual currents with green light, when you use green light, you can inhibit neuronal activity, but at red light, you will sense it. And what you see here is that there's no crosstalk. So when you 
for both 